welcome to this panel on anti-Asian racism, especially as we, as we reflect on the Atlanta shootings and beyond. It's an event that's co-sponsored by Wheaton College's Intercultural Engagement Office and the Asian American Christian Collaborative. My name is Raymond Chang and I serve at Wheaton College in the Chaplain's Office, as well as serving as the president of the Asian American Christian Collaborative. But before I begin, I'd like to thank Dr. Sheila Caldwell for enabling this event to happen, as well as thanking uh, my esteemed panelists, who I will introduce in just a little while. We're hosting this event uh, because Asian Americans have been witnessing an increased climate of hate and anti-Asian racism. Though racism against Asian American communities is not new, it does seem like there has been a significant shift since some of the nation's highest leaders began to use China virus and Kung flu to describe COVID-19. In the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been nearly 4,000 cases of anti-Asian hate and violence reported to stop AAPI hate. The majority of the reports in, and the incidents were uh, against Asian women. They range from people of Asian descent to being chased, uh, Asian, Asian descent to be chased down streets. They were yelled at, spit on, coughed at, shoved, slashed, stabbed, killed, and massacred. From a Myanmar family, which included two children ages five and two who were stabbed because they were thought to have been Chinese, to an elderly woman getting lit on fire, a woman who had acid thrown on her while she was taking out the trash, to numerous people being told to go back to China where they quote unquote came from, which is a very common trope. One quarter of the children or youth uh, among the Asian American community have been racially bullied. And by the middle of the summer, Pew Research reported that at least 40% of the Asian American population had been on the receiving end of anti-Asian racism. And as we've seen, uh, especially beginning in the, in the winter months, our elderly were shoved and killed. Then news reports started coming out about Asian Americans who were killed one after another. 84-year-old Thai man, Visha Ratanapakti, was shoved and killed in San Francisco. Filipino-American and Navy veteran, Angelo Quinto, died of asphy asphyxiation under the knee of a police officer. 19-year-old Chinese-American, Christian Hall, was shot seven times and killed by the police in Monroe County, Pennsylvania. Filipino-American, Juanito Falcon, was punched in the face, fell to the ground, and died two days later. 75-year-old Chinese man named Pak Ho was robbed and killed in Oakland. Then on March 16 in Atlanta, eight people were killed, six of whom were Asian women, four Korean, two Chinese. The perpetrator was a self-professed Christian who was not only raised in an evangelical church, but an active member within it. This massacre, unlocked a co collective racial trauma among Asian Americans that was really felt throughout the entire country. From here, even at Wheaton College to throughout the nation, Asian Americans were reeling. Like the shootings of El Paso and Charleston, the Atlanta area shootings opened deep racial wounds. And we wanna be mindful that uh, as we navigate this conversation that there are shared experiences among other communities of color, especially the black, especially the African American or the black community that's facing um, some significant turmoil around the killing of Dante Wright. With AACC, um, after the uh, Atlanta area massacre, uh, we released a statement. Then we partnered with local churches, leaders, and organizations in 14 different cities and hosted. Uh, ended up hosting simultaneous rallies throughout the country in all 14 of the cities on March 28th of 2021. All throughout the country, Asian American Christians and friends of our communities gathered together to stand for AAPI lives. But the next day after that, we saw a horrifying video of a 65-year-old Filipino woman named Vilma Kari who was picked down and then had her head stomped on multiple times while the security guards of a New York building closed the door on her. Now, lest we think that it's out there and the violence against Asian Americans is not anywhere near to our own communities, um, we actually conducted a survey here at Wheaton College among 
uh, our, the Wheaton College community. Greg Lee was the one who, uh, who conducted the survey. And among the findings here at, at Wheaton College, here are some of the things that are worth noting. We had 120 total respondents and over 40% of the respondents have personally experienced an anti-Asian incident since COVID began, 40%. Over 70% of the respondents know someone else who has experienced an incident during that time. And, and this was prior to April 2nd, 2021, when the survey was due. Over 75% of the incidents were directed against women, which is consistent and slightly higher than the national average, from what I remember. In over 85% of the incidents, the perpetrator was a white person. In over 70% of the incidents, the perpetrator was a male. The pattern is thus white men acting against Asian women. The incidents included references to COVID, including specific rhetoric propagated by political leaders like Kung Flu, which suggests a causal link between political rhetoric and the rise of anti-Asian incidents. The incidents also include references to long-standing stereotypes about Asian Americans, like that we have strange eating habits or that we're sneaky and we're untrustworthy, that we're dirty and filthy or that we're perpetual foreigners. The rise of anti-Asian incidents since COVID really reflects a much longer history of anti-Asian racism in the country. What we're seeing nationally is just not out there, but actually is experienced among members of our own communities. And what we're seeing here is also being experienced across the country. And if you read through some of the specific incidents, even the incidents that were reported to our own uh, students, staff and faculty members, it would make your stomach drop. It's important to note that the history of Asian Americans is to go from invisibility to hypervisibility based on whether we're perceived as good or bad, clean or dirty. And right now we're in a moment where Asian Americans are hyper visible and this visibility is a two edged sword because on the one hand it makes us easy targets, but on the other hand it allows us to be heard to some degree. But there will come a point when we will become invisible in plain sight again and the question that I want to pose to everyone is will you still care for us then. As Christians, I think there's a call for us to constantly remember that what affects one member of the body affects the whole body and that we're called to weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. And one way we do that is by taking the time to understand the issues that various members of the body experience, which is why I'm so glad that all of you are here and leads us into introducing our stellar panel for tonight. I'm thrilled to introduce our panelists and our moderator to you. They are friends and colleagues who are very dear to me. So uh, as I mention your names, if you could just wave as I briefly introduce to you, that would be great. I'll start with our guests. Dr. Melissa Borja is a core faculty member in the Asian Pacific Islander American Studies Program at the University of Michigan and a excellent text communicator uh, who has really great conversations over text, but we, have, we go back every like two weeks into like these rigorous conversations and I really enjoy them. Uh, Dr. Chuck Liu is someone who actually graduated around the same time that I did at Wheaton from undergrad and he's a psychologist and currently at the University of Hawaii, but we were able to snag him and he's going to be transitioning to serve as a faculty member at Wheaton College in the fall. Dr. Karen Lee, is the provost and, the prof and a professor of English at Wheaton College and a uh, remarkable poet. Uh, she is, uh, the, as Greg likes to talk about, the second most powerful woman in the, or person in the whole, at the whole school. Uh, Dr. Jordan Ryan is an in assistant professor of New Testament and archeology span at Wheaton College. Dr. Henry Kim, is an associate professor of society, sociology at Wheaton College. And the moderator for the discussion is Dr. Pam Barger, who is an assistant professor of TESOL and ELIC program director. I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you so much, Pastor Ray, for just your introduction and just giving us a context of this important session. Uh, thank you so much for all of you who are attending this important session. I just wanna give you a brief overview of tonight's session. First, we will begin by listening to Dr. Borja's discussion on the historical overview 
and recent events of the anti-Asian racism and violence in the United States. Second, Dr. Liu will share his research on the Asian and Asian American experience in mental health. Third, we will hear from the rest of the panel about how the past and current events have affected them professionally and personally. The fourth part of the session is answering the question, so what do we do now to help our Asian and Asian American brothers and sisters? And the last part of the session, we will have a Q&A. I encourage the members of our audience to submit their questions via the chat box. Uh, my colleague Tiffany and I will monitor the questions and ask those questions towards the last 30 minutes or so of our time together. So first we will begin with Dr. Borja. Dr. Borja, I wanna ask you this question. The anti-Asian racism and violence we're seeing now is not new. Could you help us understand what's going on in the present moment and put it in a historical context? Thank you so much. And it is such a blessing to be able to speak with all of you tonight about a topic that is so close to my heart as it is I'm sure for many of you. So I'm going to share my screen. I have a few slides uh, prepared to discuss this. Everyone can see it okay? Okay. So um, I'm a historian by training. I teach Asian American history. But this year I started researching anti-Asian racism um, as an affiliate with Stop AAPI Hate. And I also started my own research team at the University of Michigan. Uh, we've been looking at anti-Asian hate incident that are reported in news media. So today I'll begin with some historical context, but then share with you what we know based on the research we've done. So the idea of the yellow peril is not a new idea. It's a very old idea. The idea that Asian people, Chinese people, but Asian people in general are a threat to the well-being of white Christian America. And it has come up over and over again uh, throughout American history. And I raise it because I think it's really at the heart of a lot of the anti-Asian sentiment we're seeing in the current moment. The image you see on the screen is an image created by George Keller during the period when eight, uh, Americans were pushing for Chinese exclusion. And you can see out of the racist caricature picture of the Chinese uh, man who is supposed to be a stand-in for the Statue of Liberty, you can see the rays coming out of his head and all of the ways that Asian people were seen as a threat. You can see on one side it says ruin to white labor. So Asian people were seen as a threat to American, white Americans' jobs. You can see diseases coming out of the ray at the top of the man's head. So Asian people were seen as a threat to American health. You can see immorality coming out on the right side. Um, America, excuse me, Asian people were seen as a threat to white Christian America. And um, finally, you can see filth. Uh, and so that also points to how Asian people were seen as uh, dirty and unclean. So I bring all of these issues up because I think it's important for us to understand the durability of this idea of the yellow peril and how it comes up over and over again throughout American history. There's so many examples of this. Um, one time, uh, many times we see yellow peril fears emerge during periods of crisis. Um, so for example, periods of health crisis. In the early 20th century, when there was a bubonic plague outbreak in California, for example, um, Chinese immigrants were unfairly blamed for that outbreak. Um, when Chinese immigrants arrived at Angel Island, they were often subjected to discriminatory and very invasive inspections that other immigrants were not subjected to because Chinese people were seen as being particularly dangerous for bringing diseases that could harm other people. These interrogations and inspections of their bodies were so invasive and cruel that when Angel Island detainees were in the wooden buildings where they were held, they often scrawled poems on the walls and in these poems often detested uh, and expressed rage at the unfair medical examinations they experienced at the borders. So I bring up these examples to show how um, there's a lot of overlap between the idea that Asian people are a threat, public health crisis, and immigration policy. Now, the idea that Asian Americans are a threat has persisted throughout American history. And even in the late 20th century, we see examples of how this has put Asian Americans in a very difficult situation. Um, the picture of 
uh, the picture on the slide is of Vincent Chin, who was murdered in 1982 um, in Michigan. As it turns out, he was murdered uh, right around the time I was born. I was born and raised in Saginaw, Michigan, in 1980, in, born in 1982 in May. And Vincent Chin was killed in, in May, uh, excuse me, June 1982. So uh, the killing of Vincent Chin really had an impact on Asian Americans in Michigan, including my own family. Asian Americans at the time in Michigan were blamed for the loss of American auto workers jobs as there was increased competition from Japanese auto workers. And my own family's car was spray painted with racist um, harassment and there was just a lot of fear during this time. The killing of Vincent Chin um, was a really important moment for Asian Americans in general, but especially for Asian Americans in my community. Um, and it, I bring it up because again, we see uh, the idea of Asian people as a threat contributing to racist backlash. And we also see um, the, the power of seeing Asian Americans as foreigners, even if they are born and raised in the United States. So this is often described as the perpetual foreigner stereotype. It doesn't matter if you speak English, if you live in America, if you were born in America, you are racially different. You are therefore seen as foreign and other. And because you are seen as foreign and other and a dangerous other, then you are more um, vulnerable and suspicious um, and you are more likely to experience racist attacks. So the perpetual foreigner stereotype as it operates with the yellow peril idea is a really important part of understanding anti-Asian racism as it's been manifest in the United States. Now here, we're coming to COVID. I think we're seeing a lot of the same themes coming to the surface. Uh, and uh, it's been unfortunate to see during the COVID-19 pandemic, many people um, refusing to use the responsible language about the coronavirus that public health officials have encouraged. Um, in 2015, the WHO changed its naming conventions and encouraged people not to use names for COVID-19 that associate, or, or any infectious disease, I should say, that associate it with a particular place or group of people. Um, but some people have used stigmatizing rhetoric, terms like Kung flu, Wuhan flu, and so on. And researchers have found that 2020 saw a reversal, a very rapid reversal um, in attitudes about Asian Americans. So anti-Asian sentiment had actually been on a 10 year decline until the first week of March, 2020, when expressions of anti-Asian sentiment online um, really rose very dramatically. And it coincided very, uh, very much with the use of stigmatizing rhetoric that blamed Asian Americans and Asian people for um, the coronavirus. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we found uh, through the Virulent Hate Project at Michigan. We read through 4,600 news articles on the issue of anti-Asian hate for 2020. So this is from January 1st, 2020 until uh, December 31st. We haven't yet gathered data for 2021 yet, but um, we have a lot of stuff that we know based on 2020. And what I can tell you is that we found a lot of incidents reported in news media uh, that involved hate incidents or hate attacks on Asian Americans. Many of these were verbal uh, incidents. So people walking down the street and having a racist slur yelled at them. Some of them were physical harassment, acts of violence. Sometimes incidents were nonverbal in nature. So people would be shunned or denied the opportunity to use a gas station or um, spit on or coughed at. And then we also documented lots of incidents of public officials or institutions issuing statements that are racist um, and that propagate harmful uh, stereotypes about Asian Americans. A few things we noticed, even though so much of the conversation about COVID has focused on Chinese people and Chinese American people. The reality is that all Asian Americans have been affected. So in our research, we found that at least 14 different Asian ethnic groups have experienced acts of hate during um, 2020. We also know that this happened all across the country. So much of the news attention has focused on incidents that have taken place in California and New York, and that's not a surprise given that there are a lot of Asian Americans who live in those places. But we know that they took place in almost every state. And 
I don't think that the states where they didn't occur necessarily mean that there aren't racist people there or racist interactions there. Um, those states probably had news media that didn't cover these incidents. Um, so this is really a widespread problem geographically. We know that all Asian American age groups have been affected. Um, many incidents involved children and many also involved elderly people. Um, and I think it's important to remember the, the statistic that was shared earlier about children experienced ra experiencing racist bullying. So one in four Asian American children has experienced racist bullying and 50% of the time there was an adult available to intervene and did not. That is very concerning. Um, in some instances have been so severe that children have had to go to the hospital to receive care. Some of these incidents have been very um, openly hate crimes um, and very violent. The stabbing of the Burmese family in Texas is one example. This involved uh, a man and his two young children being stabbed as they were on a shopping trip. Um, and the FBI actually after that incident said that hate crimes would rise against Asian Americans. But I think it's important for us to remember that anti-Asian racism takes many forms and hate crimes gets a lot of attention, which makes sense. They are severe. Uh, they get a lot of media attention, legal attention and resources, but we can't just limit our conversation to hate crimes. The reality is that a lot of these incidents are taking place that don't amount to the status of a crime and yet they still cause harm. All are expressions of racism and all do harm to Asian Americans. Um, most of the incidents that we found have uh, impacted women, 64%. Um, but I also want to point out on a matter of hope that we've seen a lot of incidents that involve Asian Americans resisting racism. And here we also see women taking the lead. So I'm going to give you a few examples of how women are calling for change, Asian American people in general, but especially women are calling for change at the local, state, and national level. Here in Indianapolis, I'm happy to say I'm part of a women's group that actually got the city council to finally last night issue a resolution condemning anti-Asian racism officially. Um, the organization I'm a part of, NAPOF, National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, has been calling the governor to condemn anti-Asian racism and also to create a state advisory commission for Asian Americans. This exists in Michigan, doesn't exist in Indiana. I know they're pushing for it in Ohio. So this is a very useful institution that can help keep Asian Americans safe. Again, Asian American people are using this moment to lean into their pain and assert their power. And Asian American women are particularly important in that, part, in that uh, process. We also see at the national level, Asian Americans are calling for change um, and for uh, elected officials in Congress and in the White House to take a stand and to um, offer support and resources to make sure we have safe and inclusive communities. Again, um, Asian American women have been particularly prominent in this effort. Grace Meng of New York, uh, for example, her resolution voted on on September 17, 2020 um, was passed. And, and again, um, in both the House and the Senate, it was primarily Asian American women who were calling for these changes. And finally, last week, I had the, the pleasure of doing a panel with Erin Chu of the Asian Australia Alliance. And she actually created um, a way for people in Australia to report hate incidents that are occurring there. Um, importantly, anti-Asian hate has been a global problem with acts of anti-Asian racism and violence happening in the UK, in Canada, in Australia, um, in Italy. And so we are seeing Asian, Asian people all around the world rising up and saying, we deserve to live in safe, inclusive, and just communities. So I'm happy to talk more about how Asian Americans have been finding productive ways to move forward. Um, uh, that is a, a topic that is particularly important to me, but I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Borja, for just the sobering statistics, but also hopeful news of how Asian Americans, especially with Asian American women, have made a difference during the recent events. Well, now I'm gonna ask Dr. Liu um, a question um, with regards to Asian, Asian American um, and their mental health. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, so I wanted to ask this um, with Dr. Liu. Um, are there causes of anti-Asian racism that you can speak of from your own research? And what are the mental health impacts 
you are seeing as a result of your experience of these experiencing types of experiences? Yeah, thanks um, uh, for asking that. Um, Melissa, thank you also for sharing. I think some of what I'm gonna be following up on dovetails really nicely with uh, what you've been finding in your research as well. So I'd like to answer that question using our study that we've been working on. So let me share my screen here. Can everybody see that okay? All right. So um, yeah, it's thank you for having me. Um, it's really nice to be back among uh, some friendly faces and some new faces that I, I don't quite know yet. I'm looking forward to being on campus this, this fall coming up. Um, but even though I'm not on campus right now, I have been working with folks at Wheaton College, particularly um, Dr. Tao Liu in the Multicultural Peace and Justice Collaborative Psychology Lab that we have here. Uh, and we've been running since the beginning of COVID, um, we've been running a national anti-Asian racism study. And so when we conceptualized the study, we realized that it was a little bit of a unique opportunity for us in the middle of an ongoing pandemic to uh, sort of explore what's happening. Um, so let's see. We had three goals for our study. First goal for our study was to document and establish the prevalence and experience of racism among Asian Americans during COVID-19. The second was to measure the impact of that racism on the mental health of Asian Americans. And the third point was to identify the factors related to the development of racist attitudes against Asian Americans among non-Asians, right? So oftentimes we're looking at the experience of racism and then how it's impacting Asian Americans, which of course is really, really important. Uh, but oftentimes we might be ignoring the, the part about exploring how do these anti-Asian sentiments develop in the population, in the broader population. So I'm gonna run through that really briefly with everybody. Um, this, is, this is an academic study. I'm not gonna get super into the, the technical aspects. If you have any questions about the methodology or the statistics, feel free to back channel me. I'd be happy to talk with you about that. So I'm just gonna kind of go over the, the results. A little bit about our study. It's an online national sample. So all 50 states were represented. Our very first wave was done in June of last year. Um, our second wave was done in October, right before the election. And then our wave three is currently in progress. We're in the beginning stages of um, following through. And so this is the same cohort of individuals that we're following over time so that we can see how things change for them as time progresses. Do, do their symptoms get worse? Do they report more instances of racism, et cetera, et cetera. And we'd like to continue following these folks far into the future to see how they are responding and being impacted by the racism that they're experiencing. So on that first point, the prevalence of anti-Asian discrimination, much like um, Melissa mentioned earlier and some of uh, what Ray mentioned, even in our Wheaton community, uh, there are 52% of our individuals in our sample, they reported experiences of nonverbal racism, such as someone avoiding them, covering their face or other negative reactions. 32% of our Asian Americans reported experiences of explicit verbal racism in which others have said something racist directly to them or indirectly within earshot. 31% reported seeing anti-Asian graffiti or racist signage. 19% reported being physically threatened, attacked, chased, spit on, or having property damage. And then 16% reported being denied access to a job or prevented from going to an establishment as a result of their race, right? So this is kind of similar and, and perhaps familiar to many of you in terms of the prevalence rates of experiences of discrimination. We then looked at the impact of this specific COVID-19 racism on mental health. And what we found is that yes, in, indeed COVID-19 racism actually does predict ne negative mental health outcomes. So for instance, uh, it predicts depressive symptoms. 15% of our pr participants reported moderate to severe symptoms of depression. It predicts anxiety symptoms, 46%, uh, which is actually a really high number if you think about it, right? For almost 50% of our participants reported moderate to severe levels of anxious symptoms. Stress symptoms, 20%, moderate to severe symptoms, and then physical somatic complaints, so physical pains, 23% complain, complained of moderate to severe symptoms as a result of these sort of uh, COVID-19 racism that they've been experiencing. Now, some of my colleagues working with Stop AAPI Hate, um, you might, some of you may be familiar with that organization, they've been looking at racial trauma, and we didn't specifically look at trauma, but a lot of our symptoms, particularly our anxiety symptoms, uh, can, can kind of map onto trauma symptoms as well, right? So um, uh, racial trauma is specifically defined as trauma being caused by acute and chronic racism, and we're seeing that in the Asian American community right now. So then the piece that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is this question of where, what is affecting anti-Asian racism? What is, based on this research, right? Um, we have sort of anecdotal evidence about uh, political rhetoric, about uh, fear of foreigners um, affecting 
the, uh, the anti-Asian sentiments that are, exist and that are driving this sort of violent and, and discriminatory behavior towards Asian Americans during this time. But we really wanted to see what the data said. So we were measuring the development of anti-Asian discrimination. And uh, the, the survey that we used, the survey questions that we used, um, had a number of different questions to sort of measure an individual's anti-Asian attitudes, right? And these are just some of the sample questions. These aren't all of them. So for example, um, we asked questions of, to, for them to indicate how much they agreed with these statements, right? It's reasonable to call COVID-19 the China virus. Asian immigration to the US should be reduced to prevent the spread of coronavirus. I stay away from Asians because they may be carriers of the coronavirus. Asians should have special restrictions and be barred from public places to prevent the spread of coronavirus. Asians are to be blamed for the coronavirus pandemic. This pandemic would not have happened if Asian people were cleaner. So we have a number of these questions that are pretty openly discriminatory about and stereotypical of Asians, right? And so we were looking to see which sort of factors, which sort of variables predict these types of anti-Asian anti discriminatory beliefs. And we looked at a number of different ones, and these are the ones that we're gonna focus on today. These are, um, and, and I'm actually gonna go through each of these. Uh, we looked at ethnocentrism, perceived disease vulnerability, religiosity, proximity to COVID-19, COVID-19 stressors, political orientation, and trust in the president. And we basically um, broke this down into three separate domains. The first domain, uh, the ones highlighted in orange right there, are what we kind of conceptualize as being individual or psychological factors that are viewed as gener uh, generally static and intrinsic to the person, right? These are sort of things that have probably existed in that person before COVID-19 ha happened. And we're interested to see which of those personality or individual factors influence and impact their attitudes against Asians. Second, we were interested in external or extrinsic factors. We we're looking at how does their um, proximity to COVID-19, people who are sick around them, impact it? How does uh, the, the ways in which COVID-19 create new stressors for them in their life, new difficulties for them, how does that impact? And then lastly, we had political factors, right? Um, political orientation and trust in the president. And so really briefly, I'll sort of define each of these. Um, really simply, ethnocentrism is this notion that my culture is better than other cultures, right? And we measure that using the generalized ethnocentrism scale. Perceived disease vulnerability is an interesting one. Uh, a, a lot of medical researchers who sort of study public health, they kind of look at this and say, how susceptible do you think you are to getting sick, right? When the flu season comes around, how, how do you think, you know, do you usually get sick? You know, are you kind of germ phobic? Do you wash your hands frequently, right? How, how do you perceive uh, how susceptible you are to, you know, catching a virus? And we look specifically at religiosity as well, because in the beginning of the virus, particularly, um, there was some noticeable pushback from a lot of churches when public health interventions were being mandated, right? Uh, not meeting together, there were a number of churches and other religious um, uh, 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 meetings that decided, hey, we're not gonna do that, we're not gonna listen to that, we're gonna push back against that, it's our right. Um, and as a result, a number of different uh, clusters were actually traced, able to be traced back to um, uh, uh, faith-based meetings. So instead of simply looking at, oh, do you identify as being religious or not? We looked at specifically religiosity. Those who study um, religious belief know that looking at religiosity is probably a better measure of belief than simply self-identified uh, um, faith, right? So we asked the question of how frequently you engage in spiritual religious practices like prayer, attending services, reading scriptures, et cetera. For proximity to COVID-19, we looked at whether you or someone you know is either at risk of or was treated for COVID-19. Right, so how has it directly, you know, uh, your exposure to COVID-19 impacted you? And then changes in life as a result of COVID-19 were COVID-19 stressors. Did you lose income? Did you lose a job? Did your kids have to stay home from school? Um, you know, did, were, were your plans for travel messed up? You know, what are the impacts of the seclusion that you're experiencing as a result of COVID-19? So, after that, we have political orientation. And political orientation was just a one simple question. We asked the question of how do you identify politically, right? And we had a spectrum of very conservative to very liberal with everything in between. It was a five point Likert scale and people could self-identify uh, how they felt they felt, fell on that political spectrum. And then this last one, uh, this question of trust in the president, uh, we asked a number of different questions about who they trust for information, right? That included your local state government, that included your medical doctor, that included the CDC, that included uh, at that time, federal government and the president. And so we specifically, we wanted to look at 
uh, this question of do you trust the president for COVID information? Because there's been quite amount, there's been quite a number of statements that the president has put out. Previous president, uh, President Trump, had put out during the, the pandemic that had been challenged by health officials. Um, he had used rhetoric around it being called the China virus, and despite pushback from the Asian American community, continued to use it. Um, and we were seeing those types of phraseology being used in anti-Asian attacks, right? So I wanted to see how this affected and whether this contributed to people's anti-Asian sentiments. Uh, and when we looked at this, we wanted to look at our results as a breakdown between race. And so um, social scientists know this, but I just kind of want to offer this as a caveat. I, I want to be cautious when we're looking at racial differences. The intent isn't to essentialize race as if these differences are somehow inherent to being black or white or Asian. It's to suggest that individuals are racialized by the world based on how we look. They're socialized based on how we look and uh, recognize that there are shared experiences by those with similar racial backgrounds, right? The point here is not to say that these results represent all people in any racial group. Obviously there is diversity within racial, group, racial groups, but that there are statistically significant trends and relationships between our variables of interest within these groups. So with that caveat, we first looked at our black individuals. We had about 80 of them in our study. And when we looked at them, only ethnocentrism predicted anti-Asian attitudes among our black participants. So then when we looked at others, right, these were individuals who identified as Latinx, uh, Middle East or North African, Native Americans, et cetera, individuals who didn't sort of fall under the larger racial categories. Uh, we found that ethnocentrism, similar to uh, the black participants, and trust in the president, right, whether they trusted the president for COVID information, also predicted anti-Asian discriminatory attitudes. And then we looked at white individuals, right? So for our white individuals, uh, a significant portion of our sample were white individuals, 552 of them. We saw that ethnocentrism, uh, how much stress that they were under as a result of COVID, right? The ways in which COVID had impacted their life, as well as political orientation and trust in the president, all predicted anti-Asian discrimination. So specifically, right? If you indicated that you had more ethnocentrism, that I think my, my culture is better than other people's cultures, right? You were more likely to have higher rates of anti-Asian discrimination, uh, discriminatory attitudes. If you were more impacted by COVID-19 stressors, you're experiencing the impact of the virus, then you were also more likely to have anti-Asian uh, attitudes. If you identified as being more con politically conservative, you also uh, were more likely to have anti-Asian attitudes. And then if you were more likely to say that you trust the president for COVID-related information, you were also um, more likely to say that you had anti-Asian attitudes. So these data reflect some pretty hard questions that we have to ask about the relationship between political beliefs, the, the stress from COVID, rhetoric and attitudes that are currently harming the Asian community, not just in the US, but uh, as Melissa mentioned globally. This is particularly relevant to the modern uh, American evangelical church because if we're inhabiting these spaces where we say we care about our Asian American brothers and sisters and the consumption, uh, in our Asian American brothers and sisters, but the consumption of political media reinforces discriminatory attitudes, then we have to make some decisions about speaking up, right? And challenging those words and ideas within our own communities. Um, and I just wanna acknowledge that sometimes that's really hard and that can be costly. Um, but I will sort of uh, wrap up this portion of it, um, you know, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about maybe some of the implications and some of the questions, but um, yeah, this is uh, some of the results from our study that we've been pulling together. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu, uh, for sharing um, just what's going on with the Asian and Asian American experience and mental health as well. Um, for this next session, we're going to open up to the rest of the panel, and we would like to hear from, um, especially first, I'm going to ask Dr. Ryan, and then Provost Lee, and then Dr. Kim, and then later on, Dr. Borja, and also Dr. Liu about just their experiences um, hearing the historical and present experiences of what's going on right now, how has that affected them professionally and personally? So I'm gonna ask Dr. Ryan to begin, if he could share. Sure thing. So in 2016, I was a freshly minted PhD and I was on a one-year contract at Wheaton College, a place I'd never heard of before. And I taught my first class <laughs> as a newly minted PhD. And at the end of that class, I had a student who asked me a question. That question is, where were you, where are you from? And I told them, I had told them earlier in class that I was from Toronto and that's why I have the funny accent that I have. But this student asked, where are you really from? And so I knew right away what they meant. They were asking about my ethnic identity. 
or heritage. So later that day, my second class, I shared with the class that I was half Filipino and half white Canadian. And I had a student come up to me after class, a student who I have not forgotten. And I, I believe he's graduated now, but I think about him all the time. And that's because he too identified as Filipino American. And he came up to me after the class and he said, I didn't know that a Filipino could be a professor here. And I looked at him and I said, do you mean at Wheaton College? And he said, no, in America. You see, I could share personal experiences of racism. I could share the fact that after my one year at Wheaton College, I spent two years at the University of Dubuque, which is in Iowa. And I spent those two years, maybe bi-weekly being yelled at, being told to get out of our country, being told that the president at the time was going to take me out of the country. I was shooed like an animal, told to get out of here, boy. I endured two years of being shouted at from cars in Dubuque, Iowa, and receiving slurs named, aimed not only at Asians, but also at Latin Americans, because being a mixed race person, sometimes it's confusing exactly how they want to racialize me. I could talk about that, or really I could talk about what really is so painful, and that is the ongoing invisibility and underrepresentation that exists within academia and also just within American society in general realizing that the job market is smaller for someone like me because there are places in this country like Dubuque, Iowa that are not safe for me to live. Because I spent those two years not going outside and being afraid to go for walks, gaining weight like 20 pounds just because I couldn't go outside. It also meant being alone in New Testament studies. I'm the only Filipino American or really North American New Testament scholar that I have ever met. I reached out and found out that there is one other who is also mixed um, and who is for various reasons not as interested in contextual theology or looking at um, new Filipino American lenses. But when it comes down to it, it's really just me. I'm alone and I've been made to feel weird and small having no community, no networks in my own discipline and yet Filipino Americans are either, depending on which statistic you look at, either the second or third largest Asian American ethnic group in the United States. And that group is also the most statistically Christian. 89% of Filipino Americans identify as Christian. And of that group, 21% of all Filipino Americans identify as Protestant, which is not a small number at all. And what that means is that although we're represented in the kingdom of God, we're not welcome at the theological table. Because you see, American evangelicals, it seems, want to missionize people who look like me, but don't want to learn about Jesus from people who look like me. And so I want to say to all the brown Asians out there who feel called to the academy, you're going to, and I'm speaking from experience here, you're going to be excluded. You're not going to be part of the club. You'll be passed over for opportunities, and you'll have to work twice as hard, but we need you. And so I say persist and resist and come talk to me. You see, part of this is this experience of invisibility and the erasure of Filipino American history that has existed in this country. And that is in part reflected as well in how we've seen anti-Asian hatred play out over the past year. I'm gonna say Angelo Quinto's name again. I'm gonna say his name because Angelo Quinto is a Filipino American who was killed by police using the same maneuver that killed George Floyd. And yet the reporting in media didn't even mention his, his ethnicity as if it wasn't relevant. Instead, it was spun as a mental health issue. And yet we have seen, we have seen studies come out and various articles detailing the history of police killing Filipino Americans as well. And so there is a very real sense in which I said at our last event, and I'll say again, the knee that is on the neck of George Floyd is on our neck as well. Or I think of Matt Dumba, the very, first NHL player to kneel during the national anthem during the protest for racial justice last summer. And yet, even though he was visible in front of so many millions, Matt Dumba was Filipino Canadian. The media reported widely, widely that his ethnicity was black. 
he is not at all black. And eventually that had to be corrected in the media, but it's widely reported that he was black, despite the fact that he was Filipino American. Again, invisible, even in front of the eyes of thousands. And I also suspect, and it'd be great to hear if Melissa has seen this in her data, that I think Filipino identity is being erased in media reporting on anti-Asian violence. I've seen time and time again, when a Filipino American is the target of anti-Asian racism, the, the, often the Filipino community will know that the person was Filipino and I'll hear that from other people and I'll uh, know people who maybe even know them or are in their circles. And yet the media will just say that they're Asian American, but obviously sometimes you can tell by the name alone that they're Filipino American. And so much of this has to do with the erasure of our history, erasure of the telling of the story of the invasion of the first Philippine Republic by the United States, the first democratic nation in Asia. Over 1 million Filipinos killed over the course of that war and the subsequent pacification campaign. A war who President McKinley stated reason for the invasion was to Christianize Filipinos as fellow men for whom Christ died and yet over a million were killed. And so there's this erasure of that history and also an erasure of the history of activism and resistance in the United States. That was the theme actually of Filipino American History Month last year, activism and resistance. The Filipino American activists and organizers of the 20s, 30s and 40s have gone before us. I wanna lift up names like Carlos Bulosan, the Filipino American novelist and poet and labor organizer, or during the civil rights movement, Larry Itliang, who labored alongside Cesar Chavez and yet has not been remembered or memorialized in the same way as his Latino brother. You know, March 16th was also the 500th anniversary of the arrival of Magellan in the Philippines and the beginning of Western colonial violence against Filipino people. And so in all of this, part of the pain that I feel and the way that it's impacted me has to do with the invisibility and erasure and the formation of not just a model minority myth, but also an underclass myth. The idea that people that look like me shouldn't be in the sorts of positions that I'm in. And I shared recently with some of you that are at a previous event, the story of how um, my family, when I was 16 years old, was invited over to a church leader's house I thought it was because that church leader wanted to mentor me, but we found out it was because they wanted to ask my Filipino mother whether any of her sisters could serve as a nanny for their children. And so that's how this has affected me. It hasn't just been this past year. This is something that has been going on a long time. And so that's why I want to encourage you who are out there and who are called to persist and resist. Come talk to me. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryan, for just your passion and zeal and just for representing the Filipino community. So I appreciate what you said. Um, Provost Lee, um, I don't know if you're available, but I would love to hear from your perspective of how this experience have affected you personally as, and especially professionally as our provost at Wheaton College. Absolutely. Thank you, um, Dr. Barger, for moderating tonight and Dr. Jordan Ryden for, you know, inspiring and fiery words spoken um, from a deep wellspring of experience and great scholarship. And to everyone here from, you know, colleagues here at Wheaton to our students, to um, friends in the community who just, you know, saw the invitation and joined us. Thank you so much. Um, and also Professor, um, for Dr. Borja for joining us tonight from the University of Michigan. Um, I think it's just a really special time to hear all these voices, to have a forum where we can air out um, some of the experiences that we are experiencing as people emotionally, that we are exploring spiritually as an evangelical institution, and also as scholar, researchers, teachers, and students just living out our vocation together. Um, so, there's much wounding and much hurt, but I also see a lot of possibility in what we're doing too. So I wanted to start with this quotation. Um, as Pastor Ray mentioned, I'm a poet, and I've been thinking about, 
you know, my current role here at Wheaton is I'm, I'm your provost and I'm also a poet and, you know, um, and also a fourth generation Taiwanese Presbyterian. <laughs> and so I'm trying to think about how all these spiritual, professional, you know, emotional things fit together. Um, so I, I, Maxine Hong Kingston, okay, so sort of a, a great grandma or grandma of, of Asian American and women writers. Um, and she was the first Asian American woman to win the National Book Critics Circle Award back when, you know, this, this is a rare thing. So she was the first one, uh, followed by Bharati Mukherjee. And so, in, um, and she's in her elder years, her silver years. Now I love this cover of her. She writes about desiring to be a poet. And I thought, you know, she's known for writing an amazing memoir and um, writing these terrific novels. Why does she want to be a poet now? And I think it's it's something in this particular line on page nine in her late life memoir, To Be the Poet. And it's simply this, whenever I meet a poet, I ask, how will poetry come to me? What are the ways? And it occurred to me that poetry is coming to Maxine Hong Kingston in her later years because she's seeking through a lifetime of experience. Yes, the discrimination and, you know, actually, you know, a, a sexual harassment too from some um, Asian American male writers, the infamous Frank Chin, Maxine Hong Kingston conflict um, that we study now in Asian American lit, Asian American studies. Um, back when I studied it, it was a newer thing, but now it's more of a canonical thing to talk about in Asian American studies. Um, and then having her house in the Oakland Hills burned down and in it her typewriter and her manuscripts and the fifth book of peace that she was working on with Vietnam veterans. I mean, that is catastrophic for a novelist to, to see that happen. Your house burned down by your manuscripts with it. And back in the day when you couldn't, you know, save this in a cloud somewhere, there are no clouds like that, not like now. So she's, the spirit of poetry comes to her after survival. So it's a margin of survival. It's a margin where um, she understands the wisdom of lived experience through the lens of social categorical liminality. And she isn't a Christian, but there's something about her that when I read her works, it just seems deeply connected and I would say almost spiritual in a way. Um, she understands the sacredness of life, of people. She appreciates culture. She has an open and curious heart. And just reading these words, these questions, how will poetry come to me and what are the ways um, help to give me some life too during this time of uncertainty um, where we have so much prolical turmoil in the midst of a pandemic. I also transitioned out here from Southern California to the Midwest and was learning a whole lot of things at once. Um, and her attitude of humility too, I think has also helped to ground this space for her, carve out this liminal space of poetry. Um, another thing, okay, so other questions that we had to respond to on this panel is, um, uh, you know, so historically, you know, some of our reflections um, and then personally how this has affected us professionally. So I first became aware of, you know, the Asian American exclusion kind of history, um, Chinese Exclusion Act. And then before that, there was actually an Asian laborer type of exclusion act. And before the more specific Chinese Exclusion Act um, was when I was a girl and I went to the town library. And this was in white Anglo-Saxon Lexington, Massachusetts in small town, New England, where I grew up. And there was a very small um, section um, that's now much bigger of, of um, children's literature. And there's this Japanese American author, her name is Yoshika Uchida. And she had written a book about the Japanese internment. And I looked at the cover and I flipped through the pages. I said, oh, here's a book about an Asian American little girl just like me. Well, little did I know what it was actually about. It was dreadful. The executive order 9066 when, when the government made a, a, a really, um, well, I would, I would say on hindsight, it was probably a mistake for our government to, to do that to our Japanese Americans. And so I brought it home, I read it, and I remember thinking, how come they don't talk about this in history class? So, you know, I'm, I'm 10 years old or something, and um, 
I'm really quiet in class. So I, I don't ask my teacher any questions. But later on, um, when I'm a little older, um, I realize that our AP history books, you know, have footnoted histories. And if I looked closely at some of those textbooks, that this would be a literal footnote in some of those textbooks and that there are some narratives that get marginalized or that don't even surface at all. And then I learned when I went to college and took some more general education type of classes to become a more well-rounded, wholly educated person, I learned that there's some histories that are not told at all. And there are reasons why, you know, they're actually social structures and power type of structures. We're not telling some people's stories. And this happens within families too, that are hierarchical. This happens within cultures, within societies, with different kinds of people. And this actually can happen, you know, globally as well. And the Old Testament tells these stories as the, in parallel, there are these social dynamics in the Old Testament. And the old, uh, the New Testament too, especially um, class dynamics. So, um, so anyway, Yoshiko Yuchida um, came back to bless me in spirit when I was writing my dissertation at UC Berkeley, and I was awarded the Yuchida Fellowship. I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, it's come full circle. This is amazing. Um, and I learned that she had attended Berkeley as an undergrad and her career had been cut short there because she was taken away to the internment camps, which made me sad all over again. So, so that's my, um, one of my historic entries into Asian American history and then realizing why I hadn't learned much of this um, except you know, through talking to people at Chinese school, you know, or my youth group at church, I went to the um, Greater Boston Chinese Bible Church. And so other than that, not really knowing anything that a lot of it is just invisible and cut out. Um, professionally, so the question about how this all impacts me as a poet or as a provost, et cetera, is um, I think I experience a lot of the challenges that all of us on this particular call are experiencing, you know, um, just more hours, a lot of stress, um, to a certain extent, feeling vulnerable, feeling fearful, um, feeling like it's really surreal, um, street harassment. So I, I did experience some street harassment actually before the pandemic, right before the pandemic, um, after the pandemic, then, you know, I, I had moved out here and I'm often working remotely. So not outside that much and I order my groceries. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm not actually out on the street much or going into Chicago or, or walking around much. But prior to the pandemic, um, I was, uh, this was actually in San Diego, which we think of as a very diverse um, place with a lot of different people. I was um, on the Point Loma Peninsula. I was grocery shopping and a gentleman, not of my gender and not of my race in another aisle. I was in the um, artist, <laughs> very poet kind of thing, artisanal homemade soap aisle that local artists would sell, you know, handmade soap with, you know, violets on it and stuff like that. And so he comes right into my aisle in my face and said, you don't belong here, get out. And it's, you know, when, and that's not the first time I've experienced this kind of things. Um, and despite the fact it wasn't the first time, I still, you know, feel a sense of shock, you know, uh, but I, I, I know, you know, you, you report it to the authorities. So I told the manager of the grocery store, um, I told somebody um, just in case something happened to me and, you know, it was, I was, I think, pretty calm. Um, there was a bystander who witnessed the incident, etc. cetera. Um, but it wasn't until I got into my car that I was just, oh my goodness, I'm just so tired of this life and this, you know, all this nonsense that I have to navigate wherever I go, um, even in San Diego. So, so on top of all the stuff that we have to do, there's that added layer where you have to scan the environment, you know, and know how to, you know, respond if there's street harassment, use directives and imperatives. No, don't, go away, document, use your iPhone to take a picture, text somebody, you know, who's your emergency contact so they know where you are, report it to the authority, um, elicit the help of bystanders if somebody grabs you. you know? so, so these are, 
are just you know street smarts and skills that that we have to have just for for being alive if you're certain category of race or gender etc um and and finally i just wanted to reference um we du bois and um, double consciousness or split consciousness and i think he he actually refers to to Hegel. Um, so if we have any philosophers or theologians, you can just correct me on this afterwards. But uh, one thing that I think um, um, racialized minority academics um, and leaders of organizations do experience is that we experience a type of split consciousness. So an example would be, say, in a museum, you've got this rope Right, so you know that rope means something, it's a boundary and it creates compartments. If you cross that rope, then you're in, I don't know, George Washington's living room or whatever it is, right? And if you're on the other side of the rope, you are who you are. You're, you know, walking there with your ticket or the docent is talking to you and you're in your Bermuda shorts because you're on vacation or whatever, you're you. So I think what we experience and has been maybe heightened during this time is that particular split uh, consciousness that W. B. Boyce talks about. It can be conflicting. It can cause a um, role conflict. So which person am I in this situation? Um, there are different ways to deal with that. You know, it depends on, for some folks, you know, there's polycentrism. So you can be a different person depending on who else is in the room and what context you're in. So with your family this way, in George Washington's living room this way, um, in your office this way, with your students this way, at church another way. Okay. And the issue with that is you become all these, you know, multiplicity of cells, but then it's also a way we socially um, adapt in order to navigate the complexities of society. There are other ways to do that is to be the same person all the time. Um, that can also cause conflict because even though you're perfectly consistent, it, sometimes you don't adjust a little bit, <laughs> then it's sort of, you know, it, 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 it can, you know, it, it can, it can cause some friction and it's just how much of that can you tolerate that tension. Um, so, so that is something that I, I do experience. I try to be a consistent person, um, especially in my role. I have to talk to so many people. So it has to be pretty much, you're getting the same provost whoever you talk to. Um, but but it, has, it has been heightened quite a bit um, in, in terms of the museum rope and being aware of what is appropriate in certain situations, what to bring up, when to bring it up, and when to speak up. And the final thing, I'll just bring in my Hello Kitty reference again. So um, in my last talk, I shared about how Hello Kitty was um, an important marker in my own socialization as an Asian American girl. Um, so my little sister and I, we loved Hello Kitty. We entered the Hello Kitty drawing contest, a Sanrio store sponsored when um, we lived for a few years, not in Massachusetts, but in, in Hawaii. But eventually I learned that, you know, Hello Kitty doesn't, she doesn't have a mouth. You know, so, so in my talk, I talked about how important it was to realize that God has designed us to be his mouthpiece, um, that we have things to say, and there are plenty of um, examples in the Bible when God used women or God used marginalized people to say something. And in fact, in many situations nowadays, I find that I am not a marginal person, as Pastor Ray Chang will, <laughs> will say in, whenever he's um, in the same space as I am. So it's a, it's um, the Hello Kitty in me having a mouth and speaking up and learning what that voice is. So that's a talk for another time, and some of you have heard that already. All right. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for sharing your experiences, both personally and professionally. Uh, we do have about 30 minutes left, but I would love to hear from Dr. Kim uh, and to, for him to share his thoughts about professional and personal experience that he's gone through. And then the, I'll leave up to the last couple of questions for our panel about what do we do next? So Dr. Kim, if you could share. Okay, so thank you, uh, distinguished uh, hosts and, and visitors and guests. Uh, last time I gave a panel talk, it was a very long winded review sheet. And so students dropped out of my class. So mission accomplished. I'm gonna give you another review sheet. We still got three weeks left. You can still drop my, no, I'm kidding. All right, so all seriousness, uh, all of this personally and professionally is just tiring. It gets old, you know about the racial tax, 
people, I don't want to talk about it. I have to. People, I, I, I want to talk about it. We don't have enough time. Uh, at the core, I would say the Lord is providing me strength as he always has. My go-to passages, if you're a college kid, you don't have one, you need to get one ASAP. For me, this was my college passage that God spoke to me decades ago, and he still uses this today. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, and Ephesians 3, 20, and 21. At the core, if I'm not rooted in Christ, if I'm not walking with him, I'm going to fall apart, and nothing is going to matter. All of this social construct, all of this in the here and now, it's not going to matter. If I think of from a personal perspective, man, I'm just so old. I've gone around the sun one too many times. Um, I know who I am, my Korean history. I'm pretty bilingual. I can get by. I know all that stuff. But I'm going to share four anchor points that I experienced personally that have shaped me. And then I'll uh, pivot into very quickly the professional aspect. So some of the guests were speaking and wow, I feel like an ossifying dinosaur. In 1975, uh, we had been in the country for a few years, and that was the fall of Saigon, and everyone was calling me a racial slur that I'd never heard before. I was always getting picked on in school, and I was getting in fights, and my mom could not understand why I was getting in fights with this word. And so the word is the same phonetic sound in Korean that is for soup. So my mom would say, I don't understand why they're calling you soup. And I said, mom, I don't understand either, but apparently this is not a good word. So if you're Korean, you know exactly what that word is. 1982, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, anti-Japan sentiments, another racial slur. So I'm no longer an Indo-Chinese refugee. I'm no longer a slur with respect to Vietnam. Now there's anti-Japan sentiments. Vincent Chen was murdered about 30 minutes from my hometown. And around this time, I had an uncle who lived with me on and off. And he also, as a 1-5 Korean American, was not understanding what's going on in this country. Eventually, got a gun and committed suicide. That is something that to this day, I have not shed a tear because it is just so deep and buried. To this day, I've not shed a tear for my uncle because it was so shocking and traumatic. He is like an older brother to me because our ages were not that far apart. 1992, transnational corporatism and capitalism. Koreans as the middleman minority is almost at the peak. We have the Rodney King fallout in South Central LA. Now the media spins me as this Black Korea problematic. You have media influencers like Cube who conflate Asian subgroups and use Koreans as a, as a scapegoat. I have many relatives. We're talking about the Atlanta shootings and whatnot. I wonder how many people have relatives, family that are self-employed. Because what I'm seeing in the media now and from people that I know in uh, Atlanta and what happened in South Central LA because I had so many relatives they owned their own businesses worlds apart of the media spin and what the actual middleman minority people are and what they're doing at this time my sister's at the University of Michigan and she has a very creepy TA graduate student sending the most inappropriate emails to tutor her privately one-on-one -on -one sessions off campus I don't know who's giving my sister more stress, me or the TA, because the TA's making all these inappropriate solicitations and I'm begging my sister to file something, do something. And she feels handcuffed and I don't understand this. Around the same time, my first Christian girlfriend while I'm at a different university, if you're a female, think of the worst possible thing that could happen to you. She told me that it happened. Now I'm fighting her. Why don't you file something? I don't understand it. And this is now where I begin to understand the intersection of race, class, and gender, and why our college experiences were a billion miles apart. It took so much mental energy for me and my sister to figure out what to do. We're kids. We have no idea. We're supposed to be protected by the university, by the TAs. This guy's a predator. He fought, she files the proper uh, paperwork, and he's expelled, and rightfully so. Now we're in 2021. China is probably going to overtake the US in GDP in this decade. We have COVID-19, we have political rhetoric. People are dancing around. I'm very grateful to Dr. Caldwell because when I reached out in October, 
she actually said, what can we do about it? And as I continue to fish around, we all know the problem. It's like we're dancing around. Who's the media mogul, the one who's xenophobic that is fanning the flames? Donald Trump. When I asked her if there's something that could be done, because this was in October when black students in my course courses were freaking out and they would have to send me emails and saying, I can't come to class because of the election. I totally get it. I understood. I wrote them an email. And this is what shocked me, not that they sent me the email, but that they were so shocked that I understood and that other faculty were not getting it. That was very sad. So we have this election, 2016, 2020. I'm a random reader. I call myself a village idiot. I love to read anything and everything that's not productive. But I go back and I'm reading history, 1876. You know what? We had the same issue in the presidential debate, this Chinese issue all over again, that led to the 1882 policy that not only created the Chinese Exclusion Act, but the flip side was the Treaty of Amity and Commerce that opened up Korea to Western missionaries. So that's why that was a pivot anchor. Professionally, again, by the grace of Christ, personal problems when they are structural ills, that is the sociological imagination. That's why I'm a sociologist. When you can see that personal problems are structural ills, all of these four anchor points, I realize they're embedded in systems. Two, there's only one sign on my door. Well, there's two. One, I have to have office hours. So I have to have that sign. But the one that I really want, the one that I have to, that I want to, theology without sociology is blind. And sociology without theology is powerless. Finally, I'll truncate this. Where I am now in an, as a professional academic, I can give a review sheet off the top of my head. I, I can give billions of books of literature of things that I've read, blah, blah, blah. What I find is the link of where I want to push this, and I'd love for our students to think about this in a liberal arts contest is, is, context, is this concept of complexity science. I'm finding that this is a language that is connecting the dots between history, literature, sociology, theology. I saw one of the craziest presentations. I saw freaks of nature from all over the world using the Wolfram language. I saw incredible exegesis from secular Jews using the Old Testament using Mathematica. That's where I am professionally. So that's what gives me hope. Rather than just regurgitating, recirculating, nonlinear, abstracted individuals out of context, but what are the actual nexus points? Right, so thank you for listening or falling asleep. I don't know, but thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for sharing your story, your vulnerable story to us. And thank you for all the panelists who have shared their stories as well. And I wanted to end with a couple of questions for the panelists. I'm actually gonna begin with Dr. Borja, but this is for all the panelists as well. Um, the first question actually is, what do we do now for those Asian, Asian American brothers and sisters who are indeed going through some stress and difficulty with the anti-Asian racism and violence? And the second one, since we have a great number of non-AAPI, and we thank you so much for our non-AAPI people who are here, I'm sure they wanna know what can they do to support us. So Dr. Borja, if you can begin and anyone in the panelists can also share their thoughts as well. Thank you so much. I have said it already, but I'll say it again. I think in the context of pain, we can find our power and that's where we need to begin. And finding the power means working in relationship with other people building relationships and building institutions um, and leaning into political power. So I have to say, I am speaking now partly as a researcher, but largely as someone who also identifies as a community organizer. And it is the, in the context of the needs of the past year that I found that it was very empowering and important and impactful to work in the immediate community around me. So when I saw anti-Asian hate incidents occur in Indiana, I joined an organization of like-minded Asian American women. I helped organize the first statewide outreach to Asian American voters in Indiana in five different languages. Never thought I would ever do that. But I realized that there are needs all around me and we can all do something useful to get people to vote, to realize their power, to realize 
that um, their needs need to be communicated to elected officials. But I don't think we should just limit our attention to government. We can do the same things within our educational institutions. We can do the same things within our own departments. So I, I think the most important thing we can do now is build relationship and build institutions that can ensure that Asian Americans have a seat at the table where decisions are made at all levels of power. I will also add that if you are a, a parent, I, I am a parent myself, um, remember that your kids are watching how you respond in this moment. And when my parents experienced anti-Asian racism in the 80s, I saw my parents at first respond in fear, but then I saw my dad realize that he would have more safety if he ran for office, which he did. And then he became one of the first members of the State Advisory Commission for Asian Americans in Michigan. So I raise this up because I know that if I had not seen my father set that example for me, I would not be doing what I'm doing now. And I see it as my responsibility to my community and to the next generation to respond to the pain with power, to respond to the hurt with courage and to do things that are really scary that I've never done before. So this is the time for us to lean into doing the things that we have never done before, but that the times and our love for community are calling us to do. If I can, if I can sort of put on my um, uh, clinical psychologist hat on, right? Um, I, you know, we look at the data and we see the numbers of people who experience depressive symptoms, people who experience anxiety symptoms, people who are experiencing racial trauma. And I want to, for everybody who is listening to this, for the friends that you have, you know even if you yourself don't experience some of these things. Um, I, I want to say that on some level, it is okay to not be okay, right? This is not business as usual. This is not what people are supposed to experience on a regular basis. These are not things that you should simply, you know, have a, a go through the day and not have it affect you. And so to experience pain, to experience feeling overwhelmed to experience days where you're like, I can't do anything. And I don't know why um, I want to normalize that. And I want to say that makes a lot of sense to me, even if you don't necessarily, even if you can't necessarily put a finger on it, it makes sense that given everything that's happening, given what you're seeing, given what you're hearing, given not just what we're experiencing in the Asian American community, but also what's happening in the black Latino, you know, sort of the, the, the national um, uh, uh, experience of what's happening. Um, it is understandable to feel overwhelmed, right? And so specifically and more immediately to that, I'll say that if you feel like you're at a place where it's, that is impact, you know, you need more than just half a day off, you know, it's impacting you, your sleep, it's impacting um, your, your, your ability to function. Um, you know, there's a, there's a significant amount of stigma around seeking out mental health services in the Asian American community oftentimes. And um, I just, you know, if, if it matters at all, I want to, give some level of permission to say, hey, it's okay. Like you can go, you know, you can go seek help. You know, uh, like there are people like me on the other end, right? Like we're not scary, we don't bite. Um, and so I, I wanna say that first is just to sort of normalize the, the challenges and the experience of it. And then the other piece is like, you know, I didn't grow up being educated about what it's like, the, the history of Asian Americans in the US, right? I didn't have, a historical framework to understand my experiences. All I knew was that I was getting picked on and I didn't like it and I internalized it and hated being Chinese, right? Like that's, that was sort of my experience growing up. And um, part of my process of undoing that and finding sort of my voice and that empowerment that Dr. Borja is talking about was, was learning, was educating myself, right? Of knowing, you know, you and the experience that you're experiencing is not so, some sort of one-off historical anomaly. It is within a larger framework, within a larger system, within a larger history of the experiences of many people who have come before you. And with their experiences also come a lot of their, um, their, their successes and the ways in which they've overcome and the ways in which they've coped, right? The ways in which they've, they've fought and the ways in which they've sustained themselves. Um, and, and, and we can learn from that. And so uh, I wanna say, we don't have to entirely reinvent the wheel but we do have to educate ourselves 
um, drawing not just from Asian American history, but looking at the ways in which other communities of color have historically resisted and learning from them and building those bridges and connections, right? Realizing that ultimately it's not just us and our isolated ethnic racial groups trying to fight for some sort of semblance of normality or, or justice, but that this, is, this needs to be a collaborative, um, uh, 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 an effort that builds across different racial groups and, and, and draws upon each other for strength and support. I can follow up with, well, what I think I'm going to do is put on the former seminary professor's hat and talk about the Bible for just a second. Um, I want to encourage all of you, no matter what your ethnic background, to remember that even though, as my colleague John Walton always says, the Bible wasn't written to us, it is for us. And so it is important for us to let it speak to us out of its ancient context and into our communities. And for our AAPI brothers and sisters, that's something that I think we often struggle to do is understand that it is also for us and speaks to our situations as well. And to allow ourselves to see our stories and experiences reflected in its pages. And so I'm gonna use a word. I'm gonna say that it's important for us to decolonize our reading of scripture. And I know that that gets some people up in arms, but I wanna be clear, that doesn't mean abandoning Orthodox Christian faith. It means refusing to have scripture mediated to us by the same colonizers who killed my ancestors. That theological tree is known by its fruit. What it really means is letting scripture speak fully and truly out of its context and into ours. Because then we'll see how it's for us and not against us. Because at its heart, the story of the New Testament is the story of imperial colonial violence that bears witness to the unjust death of our Lord Jesus on a colonizer's cross, but not suffering passively, but suffering with a purpose. And so in the resurrection, we see also the ultimate triumph over the rulers and authorities, spiritual and political. The New Testament tells the story of a persecuted group of colonized peoples, Jews and Greeks together, who had the audacity to proclaim that Jesus, not Caesar, is king, and that in Jesus's kingship, the world has been turned upside down, so that the symbol of oppression that was the colonizer's cross was in fact the power of God at work in the world. And so the weak shame the strong, the foolish shame the wise, rulers are cast down from their thrones, and the humble are exalted, Good news to the poor, sight for the blind, liberty for the oppressed, and freedom for the enslaved. Because that, Kababayan, that is our story as Christians and as Asian Americans. But I'm going to leave you um, with this. I had a sobering thought this morning, and that's this. That we Asian North American Christians have spent so much time playing at being Philemon, the wealthy homeowner, that we have forgotten who we really are because we too are Onesimus. We are colonized bodies in the master's house, bearing in hand a divinely inspired letter to announce to the church that the slave is no longer a slave, but a beloved sibling in both Christ and in the flesh, really and truly. A letter that reminds the master that they are to do good, not simply because the apostles tell them to, but because it is the right thing to do, and it is the thing to do out of love. And so when we confront this violence, when we as Asian Americans do so here in America, in the colonizer's house, we can do so with scripture in hand, like Onesimus, and with the word of God written on our hearts. And so I say, like the early church, raise your voice. Um, I guess the other question, thank you so much, Dr. Ryan, for raising our voice. And I also echo the need for us to raise our voice and to share our stories. And I think this is a really great outlet for us to share our stories and know that we're not alone in this situation. And I thank you again for the audience to listen to our stories. And I wanted to have one more question. Um, again, for, for those who are not necessarily Asian, Asian Americans, what can we do? What can they do to support us? So we'd love to hear from you as a panel, your thoughts. 
as well. And um, if there's maybe one or two questions, you please feel free to submit that in the chat box as well. So I'd love to hear from you. You know, one of the things that um, I've heard from a number of people uh, who are experiencing some of these things and really affected by Asian Americans or affected by it uh, is sometimes they wonder where their, their non-Asian friends are, right? You know, they, you know we're, we're all socially distanced, we're isolated. And these things happen in the news. And uh, you know, some of my patients have said like, I, nobody reached out to me. Nobody asked me how I was handling it. Nobody asked me how things were going for me. Like, do they not see the news? Do they not like, do they not see me? Do they not, can they not make the connection that this might be bothering me or impacting me in some sort of way? And so one of the, the, the simplest things that I can say, you know, if, if you are sort of not of the racial group, and this is across boundaries of all, all sorts of situations, right, with the recent killings, um, if you are not of the racial group of the, of the, of the victim, uh, uh, reach out to your friends who are, reach out and, and simply drop them a note and say, hey, I'm thinking of you, just wanted to see how you're doing, right? That is not a, it's not a difficult thing to do, all right? You might not have the, the words to say, you might not have the comforting, you know, uh, the perfect ways to comfort the person if they are struggling, but simply reaching out is really important and really helpful for a lot of people. So I was really upset about the incident in uh, New York where the elderly woman was kicked in the head and then the people around her did nothing. So there were multiple levels of harm there. And so one thing that you can do as um, an ally is to learn how to be a good bystander. You can take a bystander intervention training online for free with Hollaback. But this also means practicing how to interrupt racist things when they happen. So we've all been in a situation where someone uses, for example, a racist slur or stigmatizing rhetoric. So if you are a white person or a non-Asian American person who wants to be a good ally, I want you to practice intervening and practice saying, stop what you're saying. I want you to think about what harm that comment does. Stop what you're doing. And I want you to think about what you're actually saying and the impact it has on Asian Americans. Practice those skills because when it happens, you will be ready to be a good ally and we you need we need for you to be ready. I thank you so much, Dr. Borja. I just put the link to the Hollaback training in the chat. Oh, and I see Tiffany Egler found that too. So it's free and people can just click on it and, and go to it. Uh, there was a question that was asked about the bystander. Oh, okay. The inter okay, that was good. Um, any other thoughts, last words from our panelists, words of encouragement that you wanted to give to our audience today? Yes, my final question or thought is, uh, again, I appreciate hearing the wisdom of everybody. Rather than always reacting, can we take a step back and actually identify what the actual problem or problems are? and address the root issue or issues rather than fostering iatrogenesis and just going after the symptoms and spinning our wheels. So that would be my last thing uh, in light of uh, what I said before. If you're a college kid, especially, have a Bible verse that you know that God is speaking to you through this particular passage, that that is yours. You, you have to have that or you, you will fall apart. You're just not gonna make it long-term without that. One thing that was said earlier is that it's okay to not be okay. And I really wanna lift that up. I, I'll be speaking honestly, I think the past year has been hard for so many people for so many different reasons, um, but especially the past month for Asian Americans. But I also want us to remember that it is that grief that we can find something good. And um, it, is, it is because we feel pain <laughs> that we can, be a source of light here in this broken world. I, I really do feel like we all have something to offer and, and it's not, not a bad thing to lean into that grief 
because it is from that space where we can really find um, a real resilience, a real spiritual resilience to do something powerful and impactful in the long term. Personally, I've been really encouraged over the last year by, um, I've had a bit of a journey where I learned a lot of my own history um, and the history of Filipinos in this country, which I didn't know that much about. Um, you know, the New Testament also shows us how powerful history can be. The apostles continually recite and draw on Jewish history time and time again, as they continue to confront the authorities with the unjust death of the author of life. Read those first 10 chapters of Acts, they're powerful. And that history that we have, don't let it be erased. I found it encouraging, even, um, even the hard parts, even um, some of the, the darkest moments of our history, I've found important and encouraging to know. And also it, it's helped me to feel like I am, um, I'm surrounded by a, a cloud of witnesses who have gone before me. And that has been really powerful and comforting to me through a, a really difficult year. Yeah, and I'll just add a couple last words. Um, if I seem a little quiet, it's my ninth or 10th Zoom today. <laughs> so I'm just a little, a little spent on Zoom fatigue, but it's okay. I still have some bandwidth left. So um, one is I really appreciate it, you know, my first year at Wheaton, that during this time, even on a Zoom platform, we have this koine spirit. The koinonia is very much alive at Wheaton during this time. And so, um, like the other panelists, I have a, a spirit of gratitude about this. Um, another thing is that, you know, in this world, there are no safe spaces. And I remember the words of another um, childhood writer, I love Corey Ten Boom, not Asian American Dutch, <laughs> but, but she, you know, talks about, you know, during World War II and the Third Reich, you know, the hiding place um, where she hit some of um, the people who would otherwise would, would be carted off to the horrible death camps. And so she says that, you know, it's only in Christ that we truly have a safe place. And so I'm so grateful to hear the living quality of our shared um, theology here at Wheaton come alive um, in a realistic manner um, so that we are living through this time together. And another thing is in, you know, to see our academic mission become sharpened a little bit as we realize how necessary it is to have a Wheaton College that will equip Christian servant heart leaders um, for the now present future um, who are equipped for a life of Christ-centered civic responsibility, you know, um, I, I think this education of whole persons and the Christian liberal arts mission is more important than ever. We need leaders in society who can understand issues, evaluate them according to a moral ethical compass that is truly timeless and be able to recognize um, um, society's ills and understand the history ideas that have come behind, you know, how, how people have tried to solve these things in the past, where certain forms of you know, problematic types of leadership in government and what happens to entire societies of people then. Um, and that, you know, we have great arts and we have great literature that will continue to inspire us through individual voices and stories where, um, as Dr. Chuck Liu said, many people, a history of people um, can come behind and, you know, recognize their own lives in them too, which is, um, something that I see woven together as a great potential at Wing to keep pouring out, not just the other Christian colleges, but Christian liberal arts, liberal arts, period. Um, yeah, so just some thoughts there. Thank you so much again, the panelists, and thank you, audience, for this time. Uh, we will have uh, the session is recorded, so it's in the chat box of when it's going to be recorded. Um, and we will be able to hopefully provide resources for you too, for those who are interested in learning more about resources that will help us as Asian, Asian American people, but also for the non-Asian, Asian American 
people too. So um, we thank you again for the panelists. Thank you for your time and thank you audience um, for this session. So thank you everyone and have a good night.